and welcome to another starter video. My name is Stefan Eriksson and in today's video we're going to take a quick look at the Heckman selection model. And first you may ask yourself, what is this and uh, when and how do I use it? Well hopefully this is what we're going to answer that. So first and foremost, you use it in situations where you have a dependent variable which is only observed based on another variable. That is, if another variable takes on a certain value, then you can use, say, the Heckman selection model. To better illustrate this, let's look at this data that I've downloaded here. You can all access this just from the web, so you can use it at home as well. The point here is, look at wage in the final column. This one is only observed if the females in the sample are entered in the workforce. So in other words, if I would just run a regression on wage right now, a standard OLS regression, I'll be making a mistake because I only include people in the sample who are working. And hence we get a sample selection bias. So in other words, we would use a Heckman selection in such an instance like this. But you could also think about it like paintings that receive a hammer price at uh, their uh, their auction. You could think about uh, firms that uh, have that joins into a merger. If you have a sample that includes both not merger and merger and paintings that did sell and not sell, and you still run an estimation, you will make a mistake. Same here if you include wage and say people who work and people who do not work. So that's the issue we're running here. The way we can showcase this a little better is suppose we generate a variable just called employed. And this one is going to be one if wage is not missing or zero if it is missing. So if I do it like this, we look at the data again, and I got a nice little dummy variable here that indeed shows that one for wage, zero otherwise. And this is very nice because now we can actually quickly see and show that there are significant differences in the sample between women who are working and women who are not working. Then the quick way to do that is just actually run your good old regression buddy here, say take education as one of the other variables and regress it on employed. What you will see here is hopefully at least that indeed there are significant differences between these. So if you suspect such a case here, always show summary descriptives and including balancing tests showing that there's differences between your two subsamples in this particular case. We can also do it for age, for instance, but employed here with education really shows that there are a difference between women who are employed and women who are not employed. We can of course also just take the summary statistics of employed and wage and see, uh, get a much better picture, how many observations do we actually have? Because notice, employed is observed for everyone, of course, we just generated it. But wage is only observed for a subsample of people, so we need to take that into account. And this is where the Heckman two-step model actually comes in and helps you out. Because we can do this by two steps. First, we estimate a probit model, which basically tells you what is the probability of entering the sample. And then in the second stage, you estimate with your ultimate dependent variable of interest. So we can do a probit. And then we can say in this particular case, what is the probability of being employed based on a number of characteristics. Education, age, what more do we have in here? We got married and we got children. The choice of variable, we're gonna talk about that in a little moment. But first let's take a look at this probit regression here. And here indeed you see, see nicely that all of them have a significant influence on the probability of being employed. In order to use this for a second step, we need to generate what is known as the inverse Mills ratio. The deviation of this here, I'll leave it for technical paper for you guys. I'll also put a nice uh, reference here in the video so you can take a look more about how this is done in practice. A nice application of this. But what we're gonna do here, we're gonna use the predict command. We're gonna call our predicted value y hat. These are the fitted values. And we're just gonna do xb here. So what we have here, we now have predicted values. I need to now generate the inverse Mills ratio. This is where we're gonna look at my nice notes because I do not always forget, remember these normal distribution items here. And we would just have to do normal over y hat. Like I said, the variation of this, go take a look in a more technical video. What we do here, we do have it here, the inverse Mills ratio for say completion, it's labeled it so it looks nice in my data set. Label variable. IMR, and then we're gonna call it inverse Mills ratio. I always recommend you to write up nice labels so you have an idea what the hell is going on in your data set. And now we can actually just run the second step, wage, and then we regress it on say education. 
education, H, and then the IMR. Please note that I on purpose excluded married and children. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment why I did so. And here now we should have a model or a regression here that shows the effect of say education and age on wage free of sample selection bias. We have evidence of sample selection bias present in the form that our inverse Mills ratio is statistically significant. But now a few things here first. There are, it is highly recommended that you use the Heckman in building command and data. Why is that so? Because that actually takes into account that this inverse Mills ratio is a generated regressor from a previous step. In other words, the coefficient should remain exactly the same. Now when I'm going to do the Heckman model, now you're going to see again. But the standard errors, t-values, p-values, and everything there will be adjusted accordingly. So here in the Heckman model, I'll first write up my outcome equation, education and age. And then you will, after the comma here in the options, write in your selection equation. So what enters my selection equation? Education again, age, and then married and children. And then, of course, we need to tell us we need to use the two-step version. How what the options are, how they actually work. I invite you to go and take a look at the help file for that. But in this particular case, it now in one file swoop produces the Heckman two-step model. And what do we do see here is a number of items. Like first, you can compare with the regressors we have from before up here and down here, and you will quickly see that hmm, they're the same. Only the standard errors are different, of course, because now we are taking into account for the fact that the inverse Mills ratio, also denoted by lambda here, often seen in the literature, is a generated regressor from the first stage. Now, you may wonder why did I exclude a few variables? That's because the Heckman model, another requirement of it to run, but you really should do it, is include at least one so-called exclusion restriction. That is a variable in the first stage that should affect the probability of entering the sample but should not ultimately have a effect on the outcome variable of interest in this particular case, case wage. So here we have married and children, which you could put a good argument for why that should affect the probability of entering the workforce and why it shouldn't have such a big impact on the wage you will obtain. And uh, that's one way to actually do this here. And one that's very, very important. And a lot of papers, they actually don't report this as clearly as they should. And now comes a few more things that you should report and should check and which papers are often not so good at. First, you should always report your selection equation as the first step to show what's the probability of entering the sample. Don't just report the outcome equation. I know that's the most interesting for, say, what you're going to you know, deduct from this, but you need to show that everything behind you is in order. And first and, for, and second, first and foremost, well, second in this case, you will see, have to see that the two or exclusion restrictions in our case have a significant impact here. Very important to check your exclusion restrictions are okay. And you also check the inverse Mills ratio here to show that it indeed is statistically significant, that there is a selection effect present. That is, that there is a potential random selection bias mechanism going on that is captured by this inverse Mills ratio. And one thing I'll also um, recommend is that you check the correlation between the inverse Mills ratio and your various exclusion restrictions. The paper which actually puts up a nice argument why you should do this, and I'll also link to that in the description below so you can actually go and take a look at it, but they will also recommend you that there should not be too high of a correlation. Take a quick look at this and I see this one. That one sticks out. And I would often say based on this here that that is too high. So you would actually try to find a scenario where you maybe only run with married because you can do it with one exclusion restriction that is perfectly fine as long as it's a strong one but you could maybe also go for a second second exclusion restriction a different one or a third one but i would based on their recommendation say here hmm, maybe you need to rethink that one there's of course one more way to do the heckman selection model that is if i actually just copy this here and put it down here and you can actually estimate this with a maximum likelihood procedure some offers will recommend you doing so because what it actually does for you in this particular case, it will guarantee consistency that they say, and also asymptotic efficiency. And when we start with all these asymptotic things, we're talking about things in very, very large samples approaching infinity. But also remember when you run 
a nice maximum likelihood estimator in this case here. You can see the iterations here. We're running a nice nonlinear model. Just be aware of that. So it may not converge in some cases, but the coefficients and everything are often very much alike, of course, because you are essentially estimating on the same sample. So the thing you're doing here is just slightly different. But authors would sometimes opt for this one here because of this guaranteed consistency and so-called asymptotic efficiency. So that's something you would see people actually do. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my little tour of the Heckman selection model. And I hope you learned a few things today, and I hope you I'll see you back here for another class in Stefan's classroom. Bye-bye. <laughs>